Hi ho, hi ho, it's off to work we go. Hi ho, get ho, no, I pause. I never really know if you're laughing or not because I can't see you through that webcam, but in my mind, I imagine you're all laughing because you find this very, very funny. Today, we are going to talk about different types of error. We have when the null hypothesis is true or when the alternative is true. And this is the classic way a lot of books write it. But I want to make one little change here. I want to take these guys and, hey, Ken, help me for a minute. Okay, come grab the other end of this. We're going to pull it apart. One, two, three. All right. Thank you, man. My pleasure. Now, the reason that matters is because we have two different scenarios, and you cannot jump between one universe or the other. Either the null is true, and it's always true. It is the truth, or the alternative is what is the truth. It can't be one or the other. Unfortunately, we don't know which universe we live in, and so we don't know whether the null is true or the alternative is true, but whichever one is true, that's fixed. And so there's this break that I wanted to draw right here. What do we get to choose? Not whether the null or the alternative is true. We get to choose, do we fail to reject the null or are we going to reject the null? And fail to reject the null doesn't mean we believe the null is true. It could mean we believe the null is close enough to be true. It doesn't have to equal 10 exactly, but be close enough for practical purposes. So we have four different scenarios. In this scenario, the null was true and we failed to reject it. That is a good thing. Do you see the smiley face? It has a name for how often it happens. That is called confidence. We have so much confidence if we fail to reject when the null is true. There's another scenario here that's good. Can you guess which one? You have like one second unless you pause the video. It's when the alternative was true and so we rejected the null. Rejecting the null means we believe the alternative. That was the truth. That's why it makes us happy with a smiley face. That's called power. How often, if the alternative really was true, would you be rejected? Now, the other two scenarios are not good. Here the null was true, but we rejected it. That's called a type 1 error. How often the type 1 error happens? We use the Greek letter alpha to represent that. And we've been seeing alpha a little bit so far. When we talk about that alpha, we were basing what we did on the null hypothesis, and then we were making a line calling it alpha and saying, beyond this, we're going to reject. Well, since it was based on the null hypothesis, it has probability of alpha of rejecting even when the null was true, because the math was based on the null being true. So that is a type 1 error. You might guess the name of the other one. It's not like we're super creative with our names. A type 2 error is when the null was a lie. The alternative was true. The null was a lie, but we thought it might be OK. That's a type 2 error. How often does that happen? We use the Greek symbol beta to represent that. Now, it's important for you to recognize we set our alpha when we're doing these hypothesis tests. We say we're going to use an alpha of 0.05. Because that's set, it means your confidence level is also set, and they add up to 1. So if you're using an alpha of 0.05, that's like using confidence level of 0.95, or 95% confidence. They add up to 1, and over here, beta and power add up to 1. Please don't get confused that alpha plus beta equals 1. For some reason, that's something people want to do. It adds up to 1 because this is an entire universe, 100%. Entire universe, 100%. Alpha and beta do have a relationship. We'll talk about that in just a second. These guys are fixed. These guys depend on the variables that you have in your study. And rather than go through this mathematically, let's just try to get this intuitively. Let's take our sample size and we're going to increase it. What will happen? You have more data, more information. You're going to better know when that alternative is false. And you're going to be less likely to make errors. So as your sample size increases, beta and will go down, power will go up. That's assuming the alternative is true, because if it's not, then beta and power aren't even scenarios we even talk about. Also notice increasing your sample size doesn't change your alpha at all, because you picked the alpha that you're using in the study. What about error? If our standard deviation goes up, what will happen? Well, having more error in the model makes it harder to tell what's going on, harder to know that it's the alternative that's true, and easier to make a mistake. It makes sense that n and sigma are going to behave oppositely. Let's try figuring out what happens if alpha goes up. 
And for that, I really want this picture here. Here's my hypothesis test. The null hypothesis says I'm supposed to land right in the middle. But the alternative says, no, nope, you're going to land clear out there. And the alpha is our cutoff line for where we choose to reject based on the null hypothesis. If I increase my alpha, then what I'm doing is I'm drawing the line further in, which gives me more of a rejection region there. That means I'm more likely to reject. In this case, that's a good thing because we're working in the universe where the alternative is true. So if we're going to talk about power, I've just made it more likely for me to reject. That's going to increase my power because rejecting is the right thing to do in this universe. And my beta will go down because I'm less likely to say fail to reject because I've got more of a rejection region. And this is the difficult trade-off between alpha and beta. If I want my beta to go down, I can put my alpha up. But then I have more type 1 error. I, if I make my type 1 error smaller, then my type 2 error goes up. And the reason is you're changing the line. If I say I'm going to fail to reject more, well, you're going to make more type 1 type 2 errors. If I say I'm going to reject more, I'm going to make more type 1 errors. So there's this trade-off between alpha and beta. And that's why we never set our alpha to 0. 0 sounds good because you'll never make a type 1 error. What you're saying is, I'm going to fail to reject no matter what the data says. Well, you're running the serious risk of a type 2 error. Last one, let's talk about what happens to x bar. What would happen if our x bar increases? Well, it depends. Is it increasing closer to what the null set would be? Or is it increasing to get further away from what the null set would be? So what it really needs to say is what happens when x bar minus mu increases. In other words, x bar is getting further away from mu. This is what the null set it would be, and our data is further away from the null. Remember, we're talking about power and beta, which is in the universe where the alternative is the truth. The null is a lie. As our data gets further away from the lie, it's easier to know that it's the alternative that's true. And you're less likely to make the mistake of believing the null hypothesis because your data is far away from it.